this is Paul Mackey, and you're listening to One Idiot's Thoughts on Podcast. This is day 13 of the Dog Days of Podcasting Challenge. Today, we took the Lake Superior and Mississippi Railroad tour up the St. Louis River about six miles. A lot of the sites are still currently the reclamation of the U.S. steel plant from back in the day, but there was a lot of natural scenery as well. It was a good time. Almost two weeks down in the podcasting challenge, I'm rapidly approaching my vacation to Madison, Wisconsin, and will either need to pre-record a bunch of episodes or work out a quick and dirty method to produce them on the road. I may practice one of those methods yet tonight. Before that, though, I have three episodes to produce, starting with this one. This episode is called Exit Prentice Car, and it originally aired October 4th, 1974. Brief Summary Rockford discovers a body in a motel room, checks out the situation, and then locks up and leaves. The body is his client's and friend's husband, Prentice Carr. Against fierce opposition from the cops in the small town of Bay City, Rockford investigates the last days of Prentice Carr while also taking a look at Mrs. Carr's lack of an honest alibi. This is Jim Rockford. At the tone, leave your name and message. I'll get back to you. It's Maury. Got a call from Davis at the IRS. You were right. They bounced your return. Call me. Who is? At some point, I need to hit James Garner, Mike Post, and Stephen J. Cannell, but I don't think today is the day. Perhaps I'll be getting to them when I'm not doing an episode every day. Definitely when I'm not coming up on a giant block of pre-records. Just on a whim, I'm picking the bottom build actor Heath Jobes, who played Jack Clark on the payphone in the lumberyard. I found that he's been in a bunch of recognizable titles. I don't know much about pay rates for extras versus actors who say one line versus something like this where he gets all the speaking lines in a sequence, but I imagine over the 25 years of his IMDb listings he did all right for himself. First credits were Ironside and Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. In 1974, aside from this episode, he appeared in the Werewolf episode of Kolchak and on Bill Bixby's The Magician. A very Fox Mulder kind of year, if you know what I mean. Then... In order, there's Cannon, Adam-12, Emergency, and Kojak. Closer to the end of the list, in the late 80s and early 90s, there's Hill Street Blues, two episodes of Max Headroom, and an episode of Night Court. His credits are listed a lot of places, but I didn't find anything to indicate his age or whether he's even still alive, but his last screen credit was 1992's TV movie In the Arms of a Killer as Parking Attendant. An actor of this level doesn't get much internet attention, so I'll just use my imagination and decide that he is now playing Lear in community theater, somewhere in middle America. I don't normally do my favorite line for Rockford, but I did have one, so here it is. And cataloging my virtues won't work either. I hold them to a minimum so they're easy to keep track of. Totally 70s. Tennis. I'm aware that tennis existed long before and since 1974, but there is a strong through line of tennis in what feels like almost every episode of this show. Artifactoids. Bay City is a location with a long history in detective fiction. Biggest of all is Raymond Chandler's fiction. Philip Marlowe was no stranger to Bay City, and James Garner is no stranger to Marlowe, having played him in a film of the same name in 1969. I've seen reference to Santa Monica being called Bay City, and sometimes it's used to denote San Francisco. Most of the time, though, I think it's a completely fictional town, not too far from Los Angeles. I'm feeling pretty sure that Rockford's Bay City is a direct reference to Chandler, and that Huggins and company would be perfectly happy if the audience believed they were one and the same. So what worked? I liked the constant stay out of Bay City message and Rockford completely ignoring it. I also appreciated the fact that while they pointed out that Rockford looked good for the murder, the show didn't repeat the plot of him actually being fully suspected, nearing arrest and filed charges. I suspect in the next hundred episodes that will happen again, but this episode would be way too soon. I'm not sure whether the lumberyard shooting scene was in any way fresh or original in 1974. I feel like in subsequent years there have been others, but in any case, I liked it. What didn't work? I'm still entirely unclear why the cops changed up the Prentice car killing to an apparent suicide. I guess possibly to reduce the amount of paperwork. So next time is the episode Tall Woman in Red Wagon. Happy hunting! You have been listening to the One Idiot's Thoughts on podcast, produced by Paul Mackey in association with Quadruplez.com. Theme music is Too Good by Jack Mangan and is used by permission from him. 
If you would like to hear other podcasts by me, you might try The Ghostlight Podcast, a completed intro cast about the TV series Slings and Arrows, or Idget Cast, an intro cast for the TV series Supernatural. Both can be found on fine podcasting listening software everywhere or at quadruplez.com. Bare-chested and wearing a jacket. Classy.